Okay. Well, um, thank you uh, for the kind introduction. Again, I'm Howard Chrisman. Um, Dr. Sadamoto, congratulations. I am certainly humbled to be here in front of you today. Um, you know, the idea of giving a talk on what I've described as a global healthcare revolution is a bit intimidating in front of an audience like this. So, you know, I think a lot about this sor these sorts of activities and impact in healthcare. So, I can't necessarily say I'm a, a great thinker, but I think a lot. Um, and I'll share some of those thoughts with you and, and hopefully we'll have a chance to have a bit of a conversation um, uh, at the end of this. What I thought I would do first, as, as Dr. Markle referenced, is give a little bit of my background and perhaps we'll provide a little bit of a lens into the thinking um, and where I am advancing some of the conversation, at least for, through the lens of Northwestern Medicine. So for those of you that are not from the United States, uh, Northwestern Medicine is a large academic, uh, integrated academic healthcare system consisting of approximately 10 hospitals in the middle of the United States. So when myself, Dr. Carr, as an example, both joined Northwestern Medicine, we were a smaller hospital within the city of Chicago. So although Chicago is a big city, we really did not have a footprint. That is, we did not take care of patients beyond the confines of the city. And over the past 10 or 15 years, we've really developed a strategy that is consistent with trying to get care closer to the patient's home. You'll see me reference a little bit that we're gonna even continue that journey through technology and innovation. But in our current state, we consist of about 10 hospitals. We have top line revenue of about $6 billion in the United States. That puts us sort of in the middle of the pack of uh, uh, large healthcare systems. Um, one of our core and primary missions is we're a part of uh, academia. So we spend a lot of time training a young generation, the next generation of physicians and other caregivers. We spend a lot of time on our clinical enterprise. We have about 30,000 employees, so we're actually the largest private employer in the city of Chicago. So again, a fairly significant role within the confines of that, that city. Um, and then our uh, research mission is core to what we do. So although we're very proud, we have a hospital that's ranked amongst the top 10 in the country, we're really proud of the uh, advancements that we have in technologies and the ways we think about changing the world through, the re through research. This is just an example of one of our latest investments. So if you have the chance to visit us during RSNA, just adjacent to our main campus, is a new biomedical research building called the Simpson Query Building. So it's 600,000 square feet of new lab space with the opportunity to double it to 1.2 million, which will make it amongst the largest biomedical research centers in the country, if not the world. And our real purpose behind this is to advance uh, our understanding of disease through research. And so we're quite proud of the uh, efforts that we've been making in order to continue to um, improve healthcare within the world and the United States. So with that in mind, what I'd like to talk about today is what I've described as a, a global healthcare revolution. I think that um, what we're seeing today and the uh, opportunities that we have through technology and artificial intelligence really is gonna transform the way that we take care in an accelerated fashion. And so as I think about this, part of this has to do with what um, I've described as these new inflection points in medicine. And what I mean by that is there are points in time in history where I believe great discoveries have led to sort of an escalation or a rapid transformation in how we take care of patients over a relatively short period of time. I think any of us could imagine what great discoveries were over the history of medicine and when these inflection points are. So I just happen to choose a few of them. If you look at the sort of the late 18th and early um, 19th century, there were a number of discoveries that I think prior to these discoveries, the way we practice medicine was distinctly different. And so whether it was the discovery of germ theory, anesthesia, vaccinations, penicillin, medical imaging, prior to this time period, the way pr medicine was practiced was distinctly different. And there was this, an acceleration of learning as a result of these great discoveries. I would argue another inflection point was sort of in the, the mid 20th century where organ transplantation, immunotherapy, stem, stem cell therapy, the ability to use CT and MRI, as it was referenced earlier, the discoveries of the ability to look inside the body in ways that really changed how we imagined taking care of patients was significant and relevant. And I think in a similar fashion, and what is critically important to me in my leadership role, is I think we're at one of those reflection points, uh, inflection points again. I believe that artificial intelligence, although it's sort of a nice catchphrase, is really an opportunity for us to transform how we take care of patients. And when you combine that with existing and future technologies, I do believe that we're in this age of innovation, that when I look back to today, 10 years from now, how we're taking care of patients and the types of things that we're doing are gonna be distinctly different in a way that's different from the past 10 years or 20 or 30 years of accelerated care. 
combining this idea that we have the opportunity as a result of artificial intelligence and technologies to change the world, I also believe that there are a number of global healthcare challenges and changes that are occurring that when you begin to triangulate this, when you begin to imagine our opportunities with the challenges we face, and then ask ourselves as radiologists, can we lead the way? I believe that we have the opportunity to actually lead the transformation that's occurring in consideration of who and what we are. So a couple of areas that I would focus on, and again, um, I, I humbly present these. I know we can imagine uh, in the audience there are a number of other global healthcare challenges, but these are the ones that I thought really would be of a fundamental importance as we think about how to improve the world that we're in. So an aging population, I had the chance to just touch base briefly before the uh, meeting with one of your colleagues, talking about the aging population and what this means from a technology perspective, from a cost perspective. Healthcare disparity, the, the differences in availabilities of healthcare. I really enjoyed the conversation around data-driven consumerism. Um, I think that's an important component as we experience our lives in one way, how healthcare begins to mimic that, and I think a more contemporary way. And again, an underlying theme of how technology and artificial intelligence can help support this change. So just some facts that you can sort of pull up from any Google website, you know, the aging population. So in 1980, there were 382 million individuals over the age of 60. By 2017, we had reached nearly a billion of these individuals, and by 2050, it'll be over two billion individuals over the age of 60. In 2030, we're at this crossing point where we'll have more individuals over the age of 60 than under the age of 10. And as you think about this, as you think about this change in demographics, it really does create, from a societal perspective, any number of challenges. This isn't just in healthcare, it's how does transportation begin to think about a older population? How does the economy begin to think about uh, being able to support such a population as costs increase? And so in healthcare, there's any number of variables that we can imagine that will result in an increased sort of um, expectation of care for these individuals. If you just think about chronic disease and the numbers of individuals that will be exposed to cardiovascular disease, diabetes, neurological disorders, such, such, such cognitive disorders as dementia and Alzheimer's, all of these will place an unusual burden um, and opportunity on us in healthcare to think about the delivery and how we might address the aging population. This is, if you just look at the map and the animation in the, uh, what is your left hand, my left hand corner, you can see that as the colors darken, there are parts of the world will have over a third of their population over the age of 60. So areas such as Canada, uh, majority of the United Kingdom, parts of Asia, the, the, over a third of the population will be over the age of 60. And when you think about where we are today to that, there really is a significant change in how society will have to think about taking care of, su of such a group of individuals. The other area that I, I spend a lot of time thinking about is healthcare disparity. So healthcare disparity represents a difference racial, ethnic, economic, socioeconomic, so groups that are, have access to and use of care and quality outcomes that are different because of the differences in these groups. And it results in really a significant difference in outcomes in uh, their healthcare outcomes. And so again, these are just some examples that I've chosen. There's any numerous numbers of examples that um, any of us in the audience can talk to. You know, the idea that approximately 16,000 children a day under the age of five die from lack of access to health care. Uh, maternal mortality, which is, I think, one of the key core measurements when we look at how well a country is performing in their delivery of health care. Uh, maternal mortality is one of those areas. You can see the difference between, for example, being in Chad versus in Sweden. Or you can look at life expectancy in certain parts of the country where you're born, you may live to the age of 50 versus uh, your mid-80s. And so this disparity that exists and our opportunity through technology and other means to improve that and access into regions of the world that we currently can't is uh, critically important. So this is an area that I, I, uh, I actually enjoy quite a bit. Um, in my role, um, so I oversee as part of my president role approximately 1,500 physicians and 6,000 employees, um, but that's in part with and um, connected to um, over 30,000 employees in a really large healthcare system. And so when you think about the delivery of healthcare in our environment, one of the um, areas where I, I think we fall short is the fact that in all other aspects of our lives, we're so used to what I've described as this new normal. So I don't have my iPhone on me, but I imagine everyone in this audience owns a smartphone. 
And I really believe that that smartphone represents what the future is going to look like for healthcare. So it may take some other form. It's now, you know, every one of my kids has an Apple Watch, and so the Apple Watch now seems to be the more contemporary version of the way that we use technology to communicate and, and collect data. But I think that all of us in this room experience life in a way that I'm not sure on the healthcare side we're duplicating. And I think the inconsistencies around that really create an opportunity for healthcare to become more contemporary. And I think the result of that is going to be not only will we become uh, more innovative in how we provide care, but you're going to see me discuss in a bit new entrants to the market that I think will allow us to do that. And so again, any numbers of examples could be listed here. I literally woke up this morning when a different time zone to Amazon Prime informing me that my kids had just delivered like seven different, I don't even know what they are to be quite candid, but I wake up and these boxes from Amazon Prime are at my door every day. And so, you know, your ability to get anything delivered at any time from anywhere in the world. We have a service called Grubhub. I don't know how many people are familiar, but same thing on the food side. So you basically can have anything delivered. You can have any type of food delivered to your home. And Uber or Lyft or the or like, you can go anywhere you want. And so it is really a much different world today than it even was five years ago. Um, so this smartphone, what we call dependency, um, in the US, for example, 96% of people have smartphone. I don't know who this 4% are, because I don't know how I would survive. Um, but most of the world now really does rely on that technology. And the other interesting component of this is, it's not just that technology, it's all the innovation that's going around that. So all the apps that are available, so I'm sure I'm already behind, over 5 million apps are available. 200 billion of them were downloaded in 2018. So just as a sort of an example of the world of the apps, so I was walking yesterday and, um, you know, my, my French is limited to about two or three words, and I was um, sort of touring around, and there's a castle right down the road here, many of you I'm, I'm sure have seen it, and there's signage on the castle that gives a description, and you can take, I literally learned this yesterday, Google Translator, download it, take your camera, put it on the signage that's in a different language, and it translates it to whatever language that you have. And so last night, even at dinner, instead of ordering what I thought was chicken versus fish, I can actually now look at this. And so that's becoming the more normal way that we live our lives. And I think what's critically important is those expectations translate to healthcare. And so we spent a lot of time in the past decade or so talking about precision medicine. Um, I had the opportunity actually to be the interim chair of pathology, so I learned a lot about next generation sequencing and your ability to really be very precise in the type of therapies that we will use in order to treat disease. But what I think is really happening in, out, out in the world, because we all experience as consumers, is this concept of personalized medicine. If in every other aspect of our lives we're used to Amazon Prime or Grubhub or Uber or the Apple Watch transmitting information, in every other aspect of our lives we're used to that, it's inconsistent to me that you'll have to pick up a phone, get put on hold for three minutes, maybe someone answers, maybe someone does it, we finally get through at Northwestern, we schedule an appointment, it's in three weeks from now, then you show up and you fill out some paperwork, and then we're an hour behind schedule. It is just inconsistent with how we experience all other aspects. And so I really believe that what's going to happen is an acceleration in how we think about care of our patients. And if we don't, what I'm absolutely confident in, and I'll talk about this, is Apple, Google, and others will. And so I think it's really important that we think about how we're experiencing our lives and how that translates to healthcare. This is just, I think, a, a sort of a cool animation. Um, it basically, again, shows uh, how many, just by show of hands, how many people have an Apple Watch? So I would venture to guess if we had the same conversation in two years, you're going to see more hands raised because it's amazing what the watch can do. So I've held off. Again, four-fifths of my family has an Apple Watch now, and, and it just has become increasingly more common, not only as a way to communicate within your family and within your friends, but also from a technology perspective, you know, you can actually get your EKG interpreted, now how accurate that is we can debate, and then that, that in imaging and that interpretation can actually then be sent to your physician. This is just one example, I'm sure many of us have seen the remote glucose monitoring that you can embed subcutaneously that can actually read your glucose measurement, send that to your endocrinologist to make sure that your dosage and therapies are appropriate. So increasingly, this is what we are going to be confronted with, and we need to think through how best to use this in order to take care of our patients. So Michael Dake um, is a name that may or may not be familiar to you. Dr. Dake is a very well-known 
uh, interventional radiologist, that's my background. I uh, was at Stanford for many years as, and is now helping lead the University of Arizona healthcare system and uh, has spoken a lot around the idea of these new entrants into the market. He comes from Stanford, so an area of great innovation. And, and he said, tech giants have transformed the way billions of us communicate, shop, socialize, and work. Now they're accelerating their efforts to remake healthcare because the market is too big, too important, and much too personal to their users for them to ignore. The CB Insights, which is a trade magazine, informed us that in the first 11 months of 2017, so a bit dated, but at least gives you a sense, approximately $2.7 billion was invested by the top 10 tech giants, as opposed to $277 million just five years earlier. So you can see this rapid acceleration of organizations that are really now thinking about what it means to be in healthcare, whereas previously they were thinking about much different components of our lives. I think all of you are familiar with most of the names up here, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, IBM. All of these companies now have distinctive strategies related to digital healthcare. And I think all of this is critically important when you think about how we used to practice. When you have individuals in these organizations with great minds and great innovation, I think it's going to lead to what, this acceleration, this inflection point of how we care for individuals. So again, artificial intelligence, all of us, I think, have been exposed to this. All of us, I, I spend a lot of time probably imagining what the future holds. For radiologists, on occasion, there's trepidation. For uh, most of us in radiology, I hope there's excitement because I actually believe that we have the opportunity to lead the conversation around this. Uh, the dean of our medical school, for example, instead of calling it artificial intelligence, calls it augmented intelligence, the idea that we'll have information in a way that we've never had before, but it all augments our role and our thinking around this. So this was first uh, discovered and at least uh, conversed in 1955 by John McCarthy, his picture shown up here, who came up with the idea that computers can work on their own without necessarily being encoded with commands. So the ability of a computer program or machine to think and learn is sort of the, the, the idea around AI. In the uh, AMA Journal of Ethics, just speaking of the transformative change they believe and others believe will occur, is in healthcare, artificial intelligence can help manage, analyze data, make decisions, conduct conversations, so it is destined to drastically change clinicians' role in everyday practices. And I think that drastic is, is a real statement. I really do believe it will change how we practice medicine, and I actually believe for the better, and I think in ways that we can continue to lead. So this is probably a generational slide, so it depends how old you are. Um, Deep Blue um, was a computer that was designed by IBM to be able to uh, take on what was then really um, in, in the 90s, and I probably to today a bit, so these world chess masters that would play each other over multiple days and multiple games. And so in 1996, Deep Blue first played actually Gary Kasparov and lost. So I guess Deep Blue went back to the closet, worked, or, worked a little bit on his, his or her chess game, and came back in 1997 and defeated Gary Kasparov three and a half to two and a half. Um, and at that time, it was fairly monumental because the idea of a computer being able to think about moves, because obviously in chess, of which I am, I, checkers is about as far as I can go, but in chess, you're thinking multiple moves ahead. This was actually a big deal. And I think this was maybe one of the first times, other than Star Trek or Star Wars, many of us thought about what it meant to have artificial intelligence. And I think this was just the beginning, as you know what IBM has done with Watson and other companies are now doing routinely as part of their thinking of, of um, addressing healthcare and other opportunities. And as we think about artificial intelligence and radiology, again, any number of examples can be given. So most of us are familiar with efforts that are being done, for example, in the, the breast screening and tomosynthesis and the ability to improve accuracy and efficiencies. These are just some papers um, that, that you can um, easily pull up on Google. Deep learning as we think about automatic extraction. Cardiac motion detection, so the ability of uh, AI to help us think through some of the cardiac information that we're getting. This last uh, picture here is one as a result of a recent publication between Northwestern Medicine and Google that looked at lung cancer screening and our ability to detect and differentiate. I had the chance to see, sit with one of Google's leaders in this area. And it's amazing, and again, many of you in this audience are probably uh, more advanced in your, your experiences with this than me. But they're going back in time. So for example, one of the areas of focus is um, picture identification that allows them to look back in time at how a skin lesion became a melanoma 
and then therefore be able to take a picture of what, what looks like a sort of an innocent skin lesion, and then predict for the future with great accuracy that this will become a melanoma. So it's a remarkable capability, and as you think about that, not just from the imaging perspective, but from all the ways that we take care of patients, it really is going to change how we imagine patients are going to be cared for. So as we think about the future, um, one of the, my beliefs is that historically a lot of the care has been driven by relationships. Much of them have been fragmented, although I would argue that our, uh, our partnership with industry, so Siemens and Philips and GE and Toshiba and Abbott and Merck and all, the, you know, all those um, historic industry partners, we've worked very well together to advance medicine. I think that collaboration will extend to these new entrants that I referenced earlier, these new individuals such as Amazon and Google and Microsoft and others. And I think it will take the three different sort of partners and really to advance healthcare. And when you think about this, at least on the traditional side of healthcare, our side of healthcare, academic medicine and research and science um, and, and physicians and, uh, and others, what I think will be important is that these individuals have a comfort with technology a historic use of innovation, and then have a practice pattern of collaboration and then deep knowledge across all fields. You, you know, when, when you look back at some of the great minds and leaders in medicine, not all of them have necessarily been collaborators, not all of them necessarily have deep content again, across all diseases, which really has served us very well in many areas. But going forward, as you think about this innovation inflection point, I do believe there are going to be certain individuals currently in healthcare who will have the opportunity to lead rather than follow. So I enjoy this slide just to, to sort of present some humor. So how many in the audience are radiologists? And then all of you, I think, uh, are, are partnered with scientists who are leading and advancing the field of radiology. So for those of us that went into radiology, you know, you had to have a degree of, of humbleness, acknowledging that people had a certain perception of who and what your specialty was. So if you Google the perception of radiology, you literally pull up five reasons why radiologists are not real doctors. Or, you know, radiologists are doctors too. Um, if you read the quote at the bottom, it's, you know, many of my patients I come across today still do not know that a radiologist is a physician. And so, as an interventional radiologist, I still have to explain to my kids exactly what I do. And so, I think there's a degree of sort of reflection and, and perception that exists. And um, I don't struggle with this. I think um, all of us have the confidence in what we do. But there is a perception within medicine, at least in the United States, but I imagine it goes beyond that, that radiologists sort of are a certain group of physicians that are you know, great thinkers but tend to you know, be in the basement, be in dark rooms, not necessarily sort of leading the efforts, um, but obviously are foundational to, to the advancement of medicine. And this is ex exemplified by just some, again, bullet points here. We could probably pull hundreds of these examples up. But some of the greatest individuals in the history of medicine that have led to uh, our foundational improvement in how we care are listed here. So obviously, uh, William Rentgen, the discovery of x-ray in 1901, won the first Nobel Prize for Physics. Um, Hounsfield, the discovery of CT. Uh, Lauterbert and uh, Mansfield, um, discoveries of uh, MRI and the subsequent Nobel Prize that was awarded to them. And then Charles Daughter, the father of angiography, the first uh, individual to do uh, translumal angioplasty. Each of these individuals are core to radiology and foundational. I mean, imagining taking care of patients today without these uh, great advancements. From an innovation perspective, again, any numbers of advancements can be listed. Many of you have participated in great innovation. So if you look at radiology, we hold amongst the greatest numbers of patents from a physician perspective as well as IP, decades of advancement. So it's not just the discovery of this technology, but it's the advancement. It's, it's what this audience does. And so our ability to do many of the things that you've discovered would not have occurred but for you. And I would argue most other specialties don't necessarily advance technology to the same degree that radiology does. Obviously, if I was in front of a different audience, I might phrase that differently. But I do think we, uh, as radiologists, I do think we have always led this from an innovation and technology perspective. I was talking to Dr. Robert Vogelzang, who's an endovascular specialist, happens to be uh, at Northwestern, a great thinker, past president of SIR. And as I was going through this list, he said, you know, don't forget DICOM. So DICOM, as you're all aware, is are willing to transfer, store, use imaging. And he goes, in 1985, ACR was a primary discoverer, accelerant of DICOM. And even today, DICOM is the foundation for how we transfer and store images. So, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they're thinking about this. And it really did jumpstart medical information age. And so 
All of these really are very fair and le legitimate reflections upon the role radiology has played throughout the history of medicine. So this, despite the question, are we doctors? Yes, we are, and not only are we doctors, but we're innovators and great thinkers. So one other aspect that was sort of relatively new thinking to me, but I found intriguing as part of the traits one might imagine in leading the future state of healthcare is this idea of an expert generalist. So again, Dr. Vogelzang, as we're having this conversation, uh, talked to me about this concept of expert generalist and had me look up Charles Munger. So I'm not sure if anyone in the audience has ever heard of this gentleman. I, I had not. But he is one of Warren Buffett's longtime colleagues and partners and has given great credit for the success of Warren Buffett. And part of what he's known for is this concept of this expert generalist that he studied widely and deeply, not just in the area of sort of finance and financial performance and investment, but across a broad swath of topics such as biology, psychology, law, and mathematics. And so Bill Gates is described as one of the truly broadest thinkers I've ever met. And Bill, and I'm sorry, um, Warren Buffett gives great credit to him as being one of the key components of his success. And I mention this because I think, unlike many other modern specialties, radiologists do maintain a core of this. Now, over time, all of us have become increasingly subspecialized by the nature of what we do. But I would argue many of us maintain this broad thinking, this comfort level in multiple different disease states, different types of technology. And again, in my role as president, I oversee every, every specialty that's out there. And um, you know, our thoracic surgeons, our transplant surgeons, our cardiac surgeons, um, I'm not going to not say they're not broad thinkers, but they are sort of very focused in their thinking, and they're very sort of vertical in that thinking. And I do believe radiology in general, um, as specialized as we've become, still maintain this expert generalist concept. And I think that will be important as you think about how do we imagine the role artificial intelligence and technology plays, and I do believe it differentiates us. And so I go back to the beginning and, and when I ask the question of, why shouldn't radiology lead the way? When we think about the challenges that we're faced from a global perspective, an aging population, we're gonna to have to bring technology closer to home as we think about the cost of this population, as we think about transportation, um, disparity of healthcare distribution and how do we use technology to really reach individuals in different parts of the world. I think that, that the individuals from the healthcare perspective, from the science perspective, from the physician perspective, will have to be individuals who are comfortable with technology, who have a history of innovation, and who are known to have the ability to collaborate across multiple different areas. And so I leave you with the question, if not us, who? Why wouldn't radiology really lead the technology revolution? And so one, again, I'm humbled that I was asked to present for the first lecture, um, and I'm appreciative very much of your time. Thank you.